I welcome everybody to uh, MB webinars, Mikey's board webinars. I think I'm, uh, without hurting anybody's feelings, I think I've been more excited about this presentation than any of the other ones so far. Me too. I know Doyle's done yep. his homework. He's got a great collection of photos and stories about the days of yore. And we all love truck mounts. Did Mikey just uh, go by? He lost, he, we lost Mikey. Um, well, I get to play Ed McMahon here and take over a minute. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, welcome again tonight, and, uh, and great to see Leon here too, but uh, we were just chatting before the live button was hit, and, and Doyle, and you know, the history of all of our families, and the history of hot water extraction, just the, but the history of carpet cleaning in general, and Doyle, I just got to say, bless you for doing this for our industry and the history I mean and for me it's an exciting passion um, seeing and hearing all that's going and plus are you know our, all of our families here that are in front of us probably on this screen have had a long history of uh, carpet cleaning so we're kind of waiting for Mikey here and I'm punting the ball as best I can but um, I guess I'm just going to kind of lead the fray and uh, you know you guys maybe you did a quickie of what you're going to do tonight. So Doyle, could you tell us a little bit about what you've got going here yeah, for well, us this evening? Yeah, basically what we're going to be doing is looking through a PowerPoint. And before everybody rolls their eyes into the back of their head and falls asleep <laughs> or roll another PowerPoint, it does have some interesting pictures and some some of the stories that we're going to talk about just don't go well without pictures. So exactly. That, We'll start with that, but uh, so I'm going to, if you're ready, um, yep. Mark, I'm going to go ahead and take the screen Let's over. Okay. Yeah. We'll get Mikey on here. It's just too bad. He'll have to watch the recording to see what's going on, but yes, awesome. Looking forward to this. No, I'm back. Holy <laughs> moly. I don't know what happened there. Just kabow, man. You didn't right, pay your bill. That's what it is. Can everybody see the screen all right then? We'll get Looks rolling. Great. So. Um, yeah. Uh, Mark was talking about previously, uh, what the, I, I wrote a blog, probably the guy who finally really got me over the hump on getting this done, and I want to give credit to him, is Joe Kowalski. Uh, Joe, Joe, as you know, is related to Ed York, and he came over to Hydromaster last year, and, and his poor cameraman, because he and I sat and told old carpet cleaning stories for about two hours while we were supposed to be talking about Hydromaster truck mounts, and I think his cameraman's eyes glossed over, and but we had a good time, and, and that really got it going. But there is a blog that has, if you're interested in some of the history, we've tried to date it back to the to the 1800s. Um, as there's some fun things in there, like they used to use bull's gall to clean carpet. I'm not even sure what bull's gall is, hmm. but I'm afraid to find out because I think it might be from the gall bladder of a bull. So they used to clean rugs with bull's gall. That so there's some fun things going back in that, but the fact is that uh, it's a lot of fun to go through this. And so what we're going to do is today we're going to primarily concentrate on the development of hot water extraction cleaning equipment for the professional. And but when I say that, the first thing I want to emphasize to people is even though today, you know, probably 90 percent, 85 percent of the "Quote unquote hot water extraction carpet cleaning equipment that is being used is used in the commercial marketplace in what we would all refer to as the Jansan market. But the truth is, it was entrepreneurs who were operating residential carpet cleaning companies that drove the development of hot water extraction equipment. So that alone is something I think that's that's good for our industry to take pride in is." We invented all this stuff. Our, our our predecessors are the ones, you know, if you're looking at a Tenant or, or Windsor or Advance's latest ride-on extractor that they're driving up and down the, the terminal at the airport, that started with some of the equipment we're going to be looking at tonight. So Chris, turn off traffic and light, please. It's pretty fun to do that. The other thing I, I wanted to mention to everybody is I like to tell the story on my first carpet cleaning job. Uh, Mark, you'll be able to relate to this, and Lee, I know you will too. It was in 1974. Yep. My mother drove me. I was only 14 at the time. I'd been out on a couple of carpet cleaning jobs with my dad and some of his customers. 
and my mom drove me and a friend there in a 1972 cherry red Ford station wagon. We used a Steamway 400 portable. Uh, for those of you who are on the line, remember the Steamway 400 portable. I think it weighed about 168 pounds. So the term portable and 168 pounds were kind of an oxymoron. But we cleaned a gas station that looks mm. that looked exactly like this one I've got in the picture. It was a Vickers gas station. It was probably 20 by 30. Um, the color that I wrote down on the carpet on the estimate is actually not the color the carpet turned out to be after we cleaned it. Uh, some of you have probably had jobs like that. Hmm. And at the, at the we cleaned it in the middle of the night. We started it at 1 a.m. and got done at 5:30 a.m. Um, I, the owner of the Vickers station or the manager felt so sorry for us. The tip that he gave us was bigger than what we'd actually charged him for the job. So, it, but that's uh, goes way back and should remind some people of some of those early days. We'll talk later about some of us uh, belonging to an exclusive club that relates to these old portables. So. But I'll start today by something that's kind of fun. Whenever you're around your buddies and they're arguing about who developed the first truck mount, the first truck mounted carpet cleaning machine was invented in 1896. So it's nobody that we know. The guy's name was John Thurman. And what John invented was using a steam-powered engine, he created a dusting machine. So those of you that are into rugs who think that dusting rugs is a new idea, John Thurman was doing it in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It was a steam generator, and it powered a machine that created air pressure through lines that went into the home where they dusted the rugs. I want to read you, this is from an ad that we found from one of these guys in, in, from 1907. Listen to this ad, because I think it'll crack you up. It says, our portable engine and air compressor mounted on a strong truck arrives at your residence or other building to be cleaned in the morning. A small hose is run into the house. The tools are coupled up, which compresses some 75 feet of pure outdoor air per minute at a high pressure, which is conveyed through our patented tools to the articles to be cleaned. Nothing is taken from the premises. Carpets are cleaned right on the floor where they belong. And I, what cracks me up about the words from that ad is you could change a few of those words, and some yeah. of you have probably written a similar sentence yeah. on your website or on one of your brochures. So I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. But the way I like to look at it, as you can see here plainly, Carpet cleaners from day one wanted more power. So they went from one horsepower to two horsepower. <laughs> so you can, you know, that's an age-old argument um, that, you know, that you have to, to deal with is the fact that um, it's got, you know, it's, it, they, from, ages, from the early ages we were arguing about. Now, this was the best picture that I found. I was not aware that Mike was this old. Here is he, and it's called the Ohio Suction Carpet Cleaning Company, and he's sitting up in the trailer. I, 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 it, Mike's going to have to share with us his, his, I guess his secret. To, he must have found the fountain of youth. I actually think he looks better now than he did then, actually. So, anyways, here's some of these pictures of some old-time rug dusters and just that you might just enjoy taking a look on as you can see they were all pulled by horses New age. Um, yeah one of the things the question that that I've never really gotten answered for sure is what killed these off in other words you can definitely see pictures of them and stories about them and ads about them through the 1930s and then they disappeared and I think what probably killed them off was uh, the rug plants. The, the rug plants started, if you know some of the old uh, rug guys that, that started their, their family plants in the 20s and 30s, I think that became the way that, that they would go pick the rugs up and bring them back to the shop rather than dragging these big 
humongous things out to houses. But uh, here's another one of my favorite pictures. This is one of the ones that Dave Bergen had. A drunk, uh, dual wand cleaning is not a new thing either. Uh, they were <laughs> dual wand cleaning in 1907 with these rug dusting machines. So that, that'll do it. So uh, Mark asked me before we went on the air, so to speak, what yeah. spurred my interest in this? Uh, obviously, one of the things, it's a selfish reason, and, and that's the, the pioneers of this industry include, include my father. And as I watch them uh, pass on one by one some of these names that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, I don't want the guys today and the gals today to remember some of these people and what they went through in the early years to really try and forge and develop this industry. The, the other thing that really drove me to do this, and, and also is, is I'm hoping an outcome of our interview tonight over the next few years as people watch this on YouTube and, and new people join Mikey's board and see it, is we were losing our history. A lot, of, as you'll see, a lot of the original companies that started carpet cleaning equipment, they're not around anymore. If they are, they've changed hands three and four times. And so it's it's been difficult to dig up some of this history. And I think, uh, I think the third reason is I'm pretty old myself. So, you know, and then the fourth reason is, you know, the old adage of those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, right? Yeah. So the... The other thing I think that really, one of my father's most famous quotes, and I'm not even sure he thought of it, it's just he said it enough that now people give him credit for it, was the change is inevitable, growth is optional. And as you're going to see, just in the 70s and 80s, the amount of changes that took place, we can all plan for the same thing in the, in the next 20 years. Nothing's going to stay the same. Um, people often ask me, do I think another carpet cleaning method will ever take over for hot water extraction as the number one way to clean carpet? And my answer is perhaps if they come up with a better way to wash clothes or other textiles, that could have something to do with it. I remember a guy writing articles about how nanotechnology was going to do that. Well, the nanotechnology isn't really working on soft fibers. Um, and then you've all seen some of the blog posts and forum posts about the self-cleaning carpet. So who knows what the change might be, but there, there will be changes. Um, and I wanted to stop here because I know that, that there's, there's going to be people that are listening tonight or that watch this later that are just wanting to jump in with their own story and their own piece of equipment. And I encourage them to do that. I, I would love to get all the pictures I can of some of the earliest carpet cleaning equipment. Just make sure if you email it to me that you give me some information about it. Because if I don't know, if it's not on here, I probably don't know about it. But some of the particular things that I'm looking for, our old friend uh, uh, Gary Heacock operated a Ball Weber truck mount literally till he sold his business before he passed away. But I need a picture of the Ball Weber and Judge Hot CC truck mounts from the, and the Steam Vac truck mount from pre-1975. As I mentioned, uh, Claude Blackburn read the blog. Uh, for those of you who don't know Claude, he was the founder of Dry Ease. And he brought up this, that he was operating a Steam Vac truck mount in the, in the early 1970s. I don't have a picture of the original first year production of the ProChem 400. Um, I'd love to have that. So if there's any ProChem folks on here or ProChem lovers that go that back that far, I'd love to have those pictures. And really, any truck mount that we don't talk about tonight that somebody knows for certain was made prior to 1975. And then any portable hot water extraction machine made before the 70s, and clean right equipment prior to 74, uh, Arlen Knight and Murray Kramer were two pioneers of our industry that I don't think get enough credit for what they did. Agreed. They basically invented upholstery cleaning, I think. And, and um, there's not a lot of stuff that I've been able to dig up from, from them. So if anybody uh, has information about that, send it to me via email. 
And that's the some of the pioneers, you know, I we don't have time to talk about these people, but what does it take to be a pioneer? I don't know. I'll tell you what, I consider Mike to be a pioneer. Mike developed Mikey's board. He saw the change that was coming in the way that information was was put out to the industry. And I I just didn't put his picture on here because he doesn't want to be considered to be as old as Jess Bishop or Steve Tuburin or some of those guys. So, But, uh, you know, the pioneers are the first people who did anything. And some of you will recognize some of these pictures. I don't have time to, to mention their names. And it's certainly any time you put a, up a list like this, I miss somebody. So um, if if you don't know who some of these people are, You'll have to dig up stories and find out about them. If there's somebody you think really belongs on this page from the that really started something in this industry, let's give them credit. All right, you ready to mark? Are we ready to move on to that? Getting to see the actual stuff we came to talk about, right? Ready? You bet. Okay. Hey, dog, can yeah, you start over? I this equipment this. Geek. I'm sorry. So can you start over? I missed oh, the first. Sorry. <laughs> start start from the beginning. I probably not, but that's our. We can do it again sometime too. Um, so now we're talking about hot water extraction equipment and when it was invented. Um, Bill Bain wrote a. If if you haven't seen it, you can Google it. It'll come right up. A 50-year history of the industry that he wrote. Um, several, you know, and I've talked to some. Obviously, I grew up with some of these people. That I'm going to talk about, like Clark Seabloom and uh, and Gene Bates. Um, I, I can remember having going to Christmas parties with some of these guys when I was very young. Um, but the earliest patent that Steamway had in its um, files is this one from 1984, and I haven't or 64, excuse me, and I haven't been able to uh, find anything earlier than this in my search of the patents. And the gentleman who got the patent's name was uh, Fred Hayes. If you look at this machine, it's kind of referred to by us old timers as the coffee pot machine. Look, because it had two pots coming off of it. And I'm not sure um, exactly who invented this, you know, who brought this machine to market. Because when I talked to Bill Bain, when I talked to guys that operated the original deep steam machine, nobody would heard of Fred Hayes. Uh, Bill Bain gave credit to a guy named Bill Wisdom. He said that Bill Wisdom is the one who, along with deep steam, brought this machine to the marketplace. But Mark Sager, who's on the line, his family used a machine that was just looked like this called the Steamtronic machine. So yep. I, it, it could be any of those. And we made them, too. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's, they, they all came out of the same basic design of the double coffee pot. And as you'll see, the, the original single coffee mm -hmm. pot was a Judson machine. But this certainly, as you'll see in some of the pictures that I show later, is one of the first most popular looks of a hot water extraction machine that came into the marketplace. Um, Judson has a patent for their this particular machine that's filed in this in the mid 70s, but they invented this machine they said in the 60s. So it was obviously one of the first machines that was specifically, and I think it was a, I think uh, Les can tell us uh, I think it was a converted wet dry vac, but it 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 did put out water. But this is my the dad uh, just chipped in down there too, and he okay. has the number one machine, the number one machine that was made in his garage yet, I guess. That's terrific. That's terrific. Oh, this, this unit here. Oh, that, tell him to send me a picture of it. The so if you look at 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 the we'll uh, do that. The, yeah, the picture here. This is the deep steam machine. And uh, their, their upholstery tool that went with it and their drag wand. I'm going to talk a little bit more about drag wands later. But this machine was specified in 1969 as the main competitor to the Steamway machine that was in the marketplace. So th this is the machine that they had pictures of. And 
that they had taken a look at and viewed kind of as the competitive machine that was out there. This is a letter dug up from the files. Uh, the, the, the founder of Steamway's name was a gentleman named Clark Seabloom. Clark's son, Clark Jr., still operates a restoration business out in Florida. I was hoping he would join us tonight but because uh, he has been on Mikey's board occasionally in the past, but I don't have his email anymore. But he operates a restoration company in St. Petersburg, Florida. But the original name of the company was Santa Clean, and they were originally going to start Steamway as a... Um, uh, a franchise. So that's the Steamway dealers here was all the people who bought the Steamway machine that this particular letter went with. And this is a trade show from 1969 uh, by a company called B&B &B Carpet Cleaning where they're showing the Steamway 100 unit, which was certainly one of the first portables out in the marketplace. Um, this particular unit, you can, there was a Steamway 200 that I don't have a picture of, but for those of you who might have an old, old, old Steamway machine in your garage or somewhere, if you've got one with gold chrome on the side panels instead of the black that I'm going to show you in a minute, that's actually before the Steamway 400, which was back that, that and this was an old promotional picture. This had a date of 1970 on it. Those polyester shags made us look good back then, didn't they? <laughs> so, okay. Hey, Doyle, we have uh, Eric from the Zipper Wand Co. on tonight, which I guess you could say he's the one that's benefited the most in modern yeah, times. Yeah, in fact, the, I, uh, I was going to tell a story for Eric in, in a minute here, specifically because uh, of that. I'll, I'll just uh, let me get to that picture because I wanted Eric to know about a particular event that happened about seven or eight years ago with the zipper wand. Um, but, so we'll talk about that. But yeah, I mean, drag wands, for those of you who laugh at drag wands, drag wands were the original way that we clean carpet. Those of us who grew up cleaning carpet in the early 70s, that's all we knew was a drag wand. And to be honest, I prefer a drag wand to this day. Um, hey, those Joel, of why did it take so long? for Eric to come up with a, a dragon push wand. I don't know. The, the, the zipper was certainly brought out things that people had talked about before, but you know, I think that has a lot to do with it. There's a lot of people with a lot of good ideas in our industry and a few people who actually take the time to try and develop it. And I think that's, uh, I don't know. I think probably because the, uh, the uh, the scrub wand kind of killed off the drag wand with the combination of truck mounts. Drag wands hung around for a while with portables, but once you hooked up to a uh, uh, once you hooked up to a truck mount, a scrub wand you know it gave you more power, and a scrub wand to do the trick. Yeah. But uh, I, I can tell you in nineteen. Master. In 1998, I helped Larry Cooper do a carpet cleaning job. I think it was 98. He can straighten me out if it was before that. He had a job where he had to clean the Colorado Convention Center in one day. It was 268,000 square hmm. feet of carpet in one day. He brought 11 truck mounts to the site and about 35 cleaners and than about 10 of us that stood around and watched all the other people do the hard work, <laughs> I guess. Um, but that day, there was, a, uh, there, was a, there was an RX-20 on the job. There was a Zinger. We're going to talk about the Zinger. And there was some old Steamway 18-inch wands and old uh, Steam Genie 18-inch drag wands. And that day, now keep in mind, one of the things they did is they had hose handlers. They had somebody on the wand and somebody pulling hose handlers. And that day, this doesn't speak to anything on a permanent basis, but that day the old Steam Genie 18-inch drag wands were the fastest way they cleaned carpet. Uh, they had a, a, the original Rotovac, the two-headed machine too, but that was before some of the newer rotary machines. 
and uh, before the zipper and before things like that. But a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, the, for those of you who don't use drag wands, that's how it started. Now, this is my, one of my favorite slides because I'm a card-carrying member of the Bucket Brigade. For those of you who clean carpets that have never had to drag clean water and dirty water up and down <laughs> stairs to a toilet or a janitor's closet, you just haven't lived yet, okay? Because these bucket brigades, yeah. and to be honest, back in the 70s, they, they, that, that is your bucket and machine, Lauren. You're correct. Uh, Lauren Eglund is on the line from us. <laughs> he gave me some of these pictures. Uh, the, one, the one on the left is from the QE2. The Queen Elizabeth II was being cleaned. And the one on the right is from Lauren. Um, those, the, 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 back then, you just walked past your customer with the dirty water, and they couldn't believe it. And then when everybody brought out the view filters in the 90s with the truck mounts and now the, the, some of the filters that are out there, <clears throat> they thought they'd invented something. Listen, it was a lost thing. When truck mounts came out, everybody quit showing their dirty water to the homeowner. I can remember a, some of the jobs I did in the 70s. I had a lady once accuse me that the chemical I was using must have turned brown in the water because there was <laughs> no way her carpets were that dirty. So some of you can probably uh, relate to that story. See, there you go, Lauren. I was giving you credit. Uh, Lauren Eglin can tell you some stories going way back. In fact, at Mikey Fest last year, Lauren and Lee and I sat around for hours boring everyone around us with old carpet cleaning <laughs> stories. Old Steamway uh, stories. Old Steamway stories. That's exactly right. Uh, and uh, Lauren's family is, you know, I think he's still, I think in order to marry one of his daughters, you had to start a, a, a carpet cleaning company and use a Steamway Powermatic. I think that was in the <laughs> prenup deal agreement or something. But uh, uh. Hey, uh, JB brought up an interesting point there that uh, I think Eric was able to create the push wand because of the invention of glides. I don't think we ever saw a glide on a wand until or a drag wand until Eric got it on there. Otherwise, you know, that's you're probably that true. metal lip. Yeah, so I don't, I don't that's probably true. Yeah, but the same way one in our ruck, probably the same one you guys are talking about. And yeah, there's no way you're pushing that thing. I can tell you that the shearing effect that you see today in the the Hydromaster Dry Master tool, the Sapphire Pro tool, the Rotovac tool, the Mighty tool, the Hydrokinetic that Hydroforce makes, that shearing effect, the first tool of that type was developed by Ron Tony that I know of. But the first shearing effect tools, the original upholstery tool that Steamway made in 1968 and this drag wand, they sheared across the fiber. They didn't shoot into them. So it, the, the shearing effect has been improved and perfected over the years, but it, it's not new. Um, so that's, that's something else that I forgot to mention about the original Steamway drag wand the way it was designed, I wish I had an underneath picture of it. Maybe Lauren can send me one. Because it shot water across the carpet, not down into it. And it, it had a very innovative way to, to suck the water back up. This is a picture. I had to show this one because this is from the, a Steamway, the Steamway showroom. I don't know what year it is. But I wanted to show it basically because everybody would uh, remember the metal fan. Uh, that's an, one of the original Lloyd's metal <laughs> air movers. So some of you probably, uh, I had a guy last year tell me he still rent some of those out on job sites. So I can't <laughs> imagine what the electricity bills are on his water damage jobs. But, uh, you know, even Claude Blackburn will tell you, Lloyd passed away a couple of years ago, but, but Lloyd is the, is the inventor of the air movers and kind of water damage restoration. So well, that sure looks like a zipper there on the left, doesn't it? The T handle. That, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's a that's a Steamway drag one of the Steamway drag ones. Yeah, it does look mm -hmm. like a zipper. I don't. I'll have to dig up yeah. and see if I can find some more information on that. Here's so another picture of some of the early early portables. For those of you who don't know, 
I don't remember the exact facts, so if I quote it wrong here, um, yeah, Barry Costa's on the line with us. He he wanted me. He remembers some of these oh, machines. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and Steve uh, Steve Knight's mentioning that Bain Clean was supplying those, but Bill told me that Lloyd made them for him I, uh, originally. So Bill may have made them a long a long, little bit later. Um, the Steam Genie Portable was invented by Gene Bates. Um, Gene was related to Clark C. Bloom, the founder of Steamway. I'm not sure. I think they were cousins. They they actually I think they met at it. They were all Tupperware, um, multi-level marketing guys. So, um, but uh, they met each other. And then St for those of you who don't know who Gene Bates is, he started G Steam Genie Portables, which later became Steam Genie Truck Mounts. But he left Steam Genie fairly early on, and he started Big Red Truck Mounts. So. Uh, I know there's guys in California that you will not get their big red machine away from them. They, um, I talked to a couple last month in San Diego, and so th those of you that are old big red guys, there's a shout out to big red. So, uh, have a picture of a big red? I don't have a, pi a picture of an early big red. That's uh, that's. If we might have one, one, one in the family. Yeah, in the yeah, 70s. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get that up. The big reds, they had, they were the motors. first, what I call big Bertha truck mounts. They were the first with diesel motors, and they were the first ones. Maybe Steam Action, maybe John Sales used <coughs> some engines that big early on, but uh, I think that they, um, I think they, they were the first one to use a 60 horsepower engine, a diesel mm -hmm. engine, a big number five. They may have even used the number six blower. Although the original Steamway truck mount had a number five blower on it too, so um, and then those other white portables in the seam are, are Mr. Steam machines. Um, Mr. Steam today is Windsor. That's that's what developed out of the Mr. Steam line of equipment. So some of you probably have some old Mr. Steam machines sitting around in a garage or closet, and you didn't even know what they are because <coughs> they were made well into the 80s. Maybe even into the uh -huh. 90s. What's the story of those they wands they being were, up against them? Uh, those were drag wands. Like I said, back then, the drag wands were, they were probably electric powered with brushes. Hmm. Um, no adjustment so to that, the that handle be, height. No, no. I doubt it. <laughs> huh. This is the CertaJet portable. This is from uh, Dave Bergen's collection of pictures. This that's a drag wand in front, but as you can see, for I, I, somebody can maybe educate me on these. There's gauges on the wand, and then the tanks were part of the cleaning. <coughs> so I'm not sure. Maybe maybe Certified was the first company to put a lie detector on a machine. I don't know, because that's the wand in front that they were using with their early portables. And these this one, according to that article in that Dave wrote in Clean Facts in the early 90s or late 80s. John Downey would have to tell me when. Um, this is from the late 70s. So now I thought we'd have some fun with some things that people talk about as being new that aren't new. Um, this is this I, this isn't this is my favorite. This is the original certified pal brush. For those of you who don't know what a pal brush is, you can Google it. A certified still makes one. I know Minuteman still makes one. But the original certified pal brush was made from a floor sanding machine. So they converted a floor sanding machine into a vacuum. And obviously that was kind of the forerunner to all of the, the counter rotating brush vacuums and machines and everything else that developed from those early pile brushes. Um, I, I remember that I was involved with the test that Mike Berry did on uh, on indoor air quality in 1991, and we were using a certified pile brush. And one of the things we forgot, we had all these microbiologists on the job with all this measuring equipment, and those old <laughs> certified pile lifters just had cloth bags. So they were just freaking out because in their minds, all we were do doing is redistributing re breathable particles from the carpet into the breathing zone. So... Um, yeah, so, but uh, I want to show that. This is the uh, Zinger. The Zinger was originally invented by uh, Windsor. Windsor later sold it to us at Steamway. It was the original 
In fact, I jokingly sent uh, Gordon Hanks at, at Hydroforce and Bridgewater a, a patent infringement letter when they brought out the CX-15 because Steamway <laughs> bought the patent to the Zinger the Zinger used an electric motor. It didn't use the pressure because it, if you think about it, it was invented for a 55 PSI or 100 PSI portable. But it had an electric motor with the rotary floor, the rotor rotating, you know, the rotary uh, jets on it at the bottom, and it worked. I mean, it worked really well. The only problem was when when we started selling these, one of the things that we may have neglected to think about is that they were invented for a portable with an, a built-in electric heater. By the way, all those first portables I showed you have heaters in them, all of them. When when extractors were invented, they had heaters. Um, what about there was only auto it, in, auto out? They did not have auto auto fill or auto dump. No, none Who's of them. Was the first to do that? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. My my guess just off the top of my head, would be uh, um, Cross American? Might be. He might have been the first guy. Maybe uh, Larry Cobb knows. I know he's on the line. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember seeing that with him. Not U.S. Products? I don't. U.S. Products brought out one really early, but I doubt they were the first. Yeah. But the Zinger obviously was, uh, Lee's saying Rug Doctor did autofill dump 72. in 72. So that's that's oh, pretty wow. early on. So you can see the uh, the the CX15. Uh, it was a you know was not the first rotary tool, obviously. Uh, but the, what I this what I was telling you is th this machine was made for portables with 1150 watt heater. When you hook up the Zinger to a Steamway Powermatic with a 240,000 BTU kerosene fuel oil burner, uh, there were a lot of those plastic parts that didn't hold up real well. But. <laughs> we we improved it out over time, but that was a that was something we didn't think about early on in this. And that's to this day, you know, whenever I, whenever I want to melt something, I send it to somebody with a fuel oil burner to see how it holds up. So that little machine uh, in that picture was so small. What was it like seven gallons capacity? No, but... that's actually a pretty big machine. That's a Steamway an Ultramatic 900. That was oh. actually uh, one of the first. Um, that had auto fill and dump, but it had a uh, it had a uh, cat pump in it. It had uh, it was a it, it was for a truck mount on wheels, really is what we called it, and it was but it's pretty heavy, pretty heavy machine. I also for those of you that love this kind of stuff, the original Steamway portables had Suter built number two blowers in them. So the original yeah. the original portables that came into our industry used positive displacement blowers, not the Amatec or Lamb electric blowers. Um, so that that wasn't an invention of the truck mount guys either. Those were on all the early portables, and I know Banclean was using them pretty early on too. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, the Workmaster was an electric truck mount. It was one of the the first ones. I don't know that it was absolutely the first one. It was made by a company in Steam Sur named Steam Services in California. Steam Services was owned by Ed York, and three of the guys that worked for Ed York were uh, Tom Hill, Bill Jensen, and Steve Brandt. Uh, Tom Hill went on to be a big-time instructor in the industry and eventually he was the administrator for IACRC for many, many years. And Steve Brandt and Bill Jensen ended up going to work for Hydromaster. And Mike Palmer at Hydromaster will tell you that Steve Brandt gets a lot of credit for a lot of the things that they did in the 90s and beyond that. The electric truck mounts aren't a new idea. They've been around. That Workmaster truck mount, in fact, I saw one at uh, Interlink Supply of San Diego was working on one when I was there last month. Uh, or maybe it was last year when I was there. They had one out of the truck that a guy is still using. They had wheels that would pull out of the van and it would you'd take it inside the building. So electric truck mounts. Here's a couple of things that that from Hydromaster and Cleanmaster's past that people they have they ever been done. On the right was a Spitfire 3.2 that was converted into a propane engine and was sold under the Cleanmaster brand, and it was an indoor truck mount. Uh, that's what it was. It, it was designed to be used indoors. 
And then the RX-20 gave birth to kind of a walk behind <coughs> RX-20. CX-20. That Clean Right and Sapphire, the VersaClean machine is kind of similar to this machine. And Clean Right's made just... one all along. Yeah, with the rotary head on the end of a of a walk behind extractor. So those those were both these pictures are both from the early '90s. So those have been around a while. I thought I'd have some fun throwing in some pictures of some Hydromaster truck mounts you might have never seen. Um, and then before we get into the history of truck mounts, the one up in the left hand corner um, was called the Hydra Air. <clears throat> there were three different versions of it. It was made with a pump out. There was no waste tank. And it was actually made specifically for fire departments to pump water out. Um, the Hydra Air below it is a different version of it. And on the, on the right are two, they built seven of these, if, if uh, Steve remembered right, Steve Brandt. These were quad one machines that the original one, it was a, it was a you know, trailer mounted truck mount with four wands coming out of it. And the original one was built for... Um, the original dome in Indianapolis. Uh, they specifically built it for them. So, uh, just some old things. Here's a, one of the original Ste uh, Hydromaster catalogs. Um, it has that industrial machine in front of the, it's not the RCA dome, I don't know what it was called. but And, and at the time, Hydromaster was making an electric truck mount too. And then for those of you that love the old truck mounts, we'll get into the old Hydra Cat in a minute. I thought you might have fun looking. at If you look in the upper left-hand corner, that's the prototype of the RX-20. Um, <laughs> what you want to talk, want to talk <laughs> about an abomination? I don't. Uh, I wanted to ask Mike what the customer if he actually took one of those into a customer's home and what they said uh, when he was testing it, but. Uh. That, was the the that may have been student. Uh, that may have been Cliff. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that may have been Cliff Monson that was uh, that was involved in that. But there's that's the original RX20 head. Some of you are probably still using those. Um, the original design of the RX20. And then I I I had to talk about drag wands. I knew Eric could be on the line, but. Um, I have to tell this story for Eric. He does, he may not even know this. About uh, I don't know, probably eight or nine years ago now, um, when I was still working at Interlink, um, uh, they brought a, a zipper wand to Interlink to try out the original one, the original inventor. I wasn't involved in any of the discussions, other than Gordon asked me to evaluate it. And my answer to him was, I'm the wrong guy to evaluate this new zipper wand. And his answer was, well, why? Are you the wrong guy to evaluate it? And I said, because I'm an old drag wand guy. I know I'll love the thing. That doesn't tell us how many people will love it or whether people will buy it. Well, I guess Eric's proven that plenty of people will buy it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was an old drag wand guy. The, the one in the uh, the drag one in the upper right hand corner I just found a picture of that on Google I have no idea what it is I just thought it looked cool so if anybody knows what it is tell me what it is <clears throat> but most of those original portable extractors um, use drag wands of all shapes and colors and sizes and some of those you know lasted for a little while once scrub wands came out but um, and then I, I guess the other that thing one that Right. That's not so yeah, long ago. Yeah, that's recent. Yeah, it's sure not that very old. Just like an Interlink product? I don't think so. The Interlink drag yeah. wand doesn't look like that. I don't have a picture uh, of the Interlink. The Interlink drag wand they, they bought the rights to. I know where it came from. Oh, Lee says it's a Vibravac, 16 inch. Vibravac? Where's the Viber yeah. come to effect? No. White oh, Magic. No? That's right. Yeah, that was a White, white Magic. Was, okay, there it is. Uh, right. Exactly. That's why. Day. That's why it looks newer. So that's a White Magic drag one. Okay. Yeah, but they they put that out about a year before they folded, if I remember correctly. Okay. Very good, Eric. All right. Now I wanted to show you some historically bad ideas from from the carpet from the cleaning past. <laughs> the first one I think you'll get a big kick out of, the uh, original way to clean car upholstery. With a woman? 
<laughs> How'd you start? No. <laughs> Look what she's cleaning it with. Yeah. Look what she's cleaning it with. I don't even know. I don't even know how to yeah, comment to that. So you used carbon monoxide gas to clean upholstery, uh -huh. but this is an actual ad. If you go, you can Google this. This is actually for sale on eBay uh, too. If no warning to roll down the windows either. Seen them on that. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess if you're really depressed, and I don't know, I don't even want to go there. But and then for those of you who thinks using sex to sell your carpet cleaning services is a new thing, uh, I have this one to present to you. What's she selling? I don't really know Lace what curtains. to say about that. That's what I <laughs> said. <Jersey>. Um, <laughs> yeah, I no, she's selling carpet cleaning. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I like the telephone number at the bottom of the page. Dial eight two two. Get hold of them. So if anybody's in Milwaukee and knows anything about J.D. Byer, if that's your great-grandmother, we're sorry if we're showing her in an inappropriate pose, but she was in an I'm impressed she shaved her armpits back in those days. <laughs> hey, so, and, of course, any discussion of bad ideas from the industry is not complete without our buddy Barry Mincow. Uh, yes, not Barry, not to be confused with Barry Costa. Uh, for those of you who don't know the story of Barry Mincow, um, it's it's kind of disgusting. So we won't go there. He supposedly cleaned himself up and became a pastor of a church, and then deflocked that flock of all their money. So mm -hmm. he scammed a lot of people out of their money. I do have to I do have to tell this story for anybody like Larry Cobb that's been in the supply business since. Time began like me. I remember when ZZ Vest was at its heyday. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about him, and I took it into my dad's office and I said, "Dad, we have got to get in touch with Barry Mincow. We have got to try and sell this guy some equipment. He, look what he's doing." And my father, in his old wise ways, kind of lean back in his chair, and this is exactly what he told me. Barry will love this because he'll, he'll recognize this. He said, son, there's nobody in the world that loves the carpet cleaning business more than I do. And there's no business in the world that I'd rather a young couple start out in that has a chance of providing them with a lifestyle and an income that's greater than they ever imagined. He goes, but there ain't that much money in carpet cleaning. Something is fishy here. After that conversation was the first report of the SEC investigating ZZZZ Best. So obviously uh, um, that Barry was uh, the most famous guy from our industry, unfortunately. So uh, hopefully, you know, Maybe Joe Polish has gotten more famous than Barry has, and he certainly represents us better than Barry did. Now, I was afraid of who might sue me on these pictures, so I didn't use a couple of the ones I wanted. But um, some machines, some truck mounts from the past, before we get into the history of the truck mount, <coughs> that didn't do so well. And I hate to bring up an old sore point, Mike, with the... Oh. Pro Chem PTO, but I will. Um, this is really a tribute to my present employer, is what it is. So it's the 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 CDS has been such a mainstay, and the Butler. I had to say that for Mark, <laughs> or he'll freak out. The, the CDS and the Butler have been such mainstays in the industry that over the years, people have come up with all kinds of ways to invent them. The one on the upper left, some people affectionately refer to it as the chimney machine. This was an invention of Steamway, so I'll have to take partial blame or credit, whichever comes. Um, Steve Brandt referred to it in a conversation with my brother Greg as the Steamway oddity. Okay, Greg called one of his machines a misfire. So anyway, um, the... The whole idea of the Odyssey, for those who never got a chance to see this, because it didn't sell well enough to stay around very long, 
was we were the first people in the world to enclose an air-cooled engine in a cabinet. The whole idea was that by venting all the hot air through the machine that and, and forcing exhaust that you could gather all the heat for a heat exchanger and exhaust, exhaust all the heat and carbon monoxide out the roof of the van so that you could close it up and you could operate the Odyssey truck mount in, in a closed van. So it was a slide-in designed to, to give you some of the benefits of, of a power takeoff in terms of... The, and, you know, one of the things I tell people is, <clears throat> for those of you who, who know about some equipment in the past that didn't make it in the marketplace, it wasn't always... This comes into place with the hydraulic... The Steamway built a hydraulic PTO, too. Prochem built two of them. It wasn't as much the problem with how they worked as that they didn't sell well enough to address what didn't work on them. That's what kills off a lot of equipment in our industry is that there that if a lot that might be great ideas. So um, you know, Mike Roden can get can tell us stories, I guess, about the ProChem PTO, or you can, Mike, because you own one, but. The, the problem we had with the hydraulic PTO that we made at Steamway was n never the operation. I mean, if the, if the hydraulic motors went out, they were pretty expensive. But the problem we had with this is it kept dripping hydraulic oil on customers' driveways. Um, so that's not a real good thing. So, um, But, yeah, there are some other machines that we won't show pictures of that, uh, that but there, there have been Texas, some machines. But, uh, we'll just keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a list of 47, 47 different truck mount manufacturers that no longer wow. exist, if anybody wants to contribute to that list. So um, I do that to try and remind my bosses when Hydromaster sales aren't what they were for a month. Well, at least we're, you know, we're still around. So, uh -oh. All right, let's get into the introduction of truck mounts, because I know that's really what interests most of our listeners. They were born after all those portables. So real quickly, as a summary of, I, of all the people I know of, except for I need to add Steam Vac to this list, to give some credit to for being the pioneer. Listen, I don't know who invented the first truck mount. We can't even agree on whether truck mounts is one word or two. So how are we going to agree on <coughs> how are we going to decide who, who was the inventor of the truck mount? I can tell you that Judson certainly invented the first machine that appears to have been used to clean something, but it was cleaning uh, uh, AstroTurf, which obviously was polyester carpet. Or, but What do you mean the first machine to actually clean something? What did all the other ones do? <laughs> well, the, I mean, first truck mount. First truck mount. The, the, ah. the, 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 sure. Because Mike Palmer invented his first truck mount in 1969. Bain Clean obviously was selling their unit as a truck mount from their birth, which I think was 68, 67. Um, how do, the, I don't understand how you differentiate those from what Judson was doing. Because Judson wasn't truck powered, right? It had a motor? No, it had its own motor. That's exactly right. But the, but the two of the original, the late 60 truck mounts were the Ball Weber and the Judge Hot CC. The Ball Weber and the Judd's Hot CC were both power takeoffs. They didn't have their own engine. Now, if I'm wrong, please for, feel free for somebody to correct me, but um, the Ball Weber and the Hot CC both took a uh, belt off of the original. They cut into the drive shaft of the van, and they just brought a belt up through the floor of the van to bring power back to the back, and so, but they, they that's they were around in the late sixties. Um, ball was Weber the belt being spun on a separate PTO shaft. I no, it was coming off the drive shaft that drove the van. That's the way it was described to me. If somebody knows better than that, that that's how it worked. So it was spinning, and the van was in uh, neutral. The van was in neutral at full throttle. That's probably where some of the, yeah, where some of the guys got, you know, enough throttle to get the vacuum power up. 
And, yeah. Um, I, I can remember from some of those back in the early trade shows, some of those, um, we need an engineer on here. Some of the, yeah, first, I know Stanley Steamer, this was their first truck mounts was like those. Um, when you listen to those truck mounts operate, whenever they were put under loads, you could hear them just screaming for help because the, you can imagine the stress they put on the drive shaft of the, of the van. But all of these companies were certainly some of the first to, to build truck mounts. So if anybody, this is the only Ball Weber picture I could dig up in the whole world. If anybody has a picture of a Ball Weber machine, her, his, Ernie's daughter contacted me one time and said she was going to send me pictures, but she never did. So I'd love to have some pictures of some Ball Webbers and some judges. Because even Mike Palmer told me that they were around when he was inventing his. Uh, so here's the original Bain Clean unit. This is actually in their museum in Indianapolis. If any of you ever go by Bain Clean, it's have affectionately referred to in their world as old number one. Um, so it's the original van and the original machine. So that picture that I have down in the, of the maxi port is not the machine that's in this van. Um, Bill sent this to me, and it's also on his um, in his memoirs when he and I were discussing some of this stuff one day, which I'm so glad I did because it wasn't uh, uh, wasn't long after that <clears throat> that he passed away. So um, this is the Judson machine, some of the original patent drawings of how it worked. Uh, obviously, he was using some kind of a drag wand with a power thing. Uh, Les Jones can tell any of you all about this if you're interested more about it, um, because he still has he he still has all these pictures and some of these units. So um, that's just some of the original Judson machines. This is the Hydromaster Baron. The original Hydromaster machine was built in 1969 in Mike Palmer's garage, and um, basically the story that he tells is that. He was cleaning carpets at the time, and he saw somebody with a truck mount, and I think he said that he was able to use that guy's truck mount, and obviously he had a little engineering in him, and he said to himself, I can build one better than that. Um, one of the reasons I like to show pictures of this old Baron is um, one of the most common complaints you hear from people today is that it's really hard to work on a truck mount. Well, one of the reasons it's really hard to work on a truck mount is because the marketplace demanded they get smaller and smaller and smaller. But if you look at this original, uh, the original Baron machine, there's plenty of room to get to the engine and the pump on and all it on it. So, you know, the 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 smaller the machines got, the more it became important to get the good things. You probably recognize. I can't think of the brand name, but Lee will tell me. Uh, that's one of the original propane heaters on the front. It's, I don't think it's a lot, little giant. I think it's the other company that made um, the propane heaters. But the so the original hydro and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, Paloma. That's what it is. Thank you, Lee. It's Paloma. That yeah, skipped Paloma. my mind. Yep. So P Paloma used a Paloma uh, propane heater, and then it used a. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. I. I think he told me it used, don't hold me to this, I think it used an Onan engine. Onan was big in the original Steamways, too. Um, and then uh, um, back then almost everybody was using high-pro pumps because they Doyle, were... I wish I had pictures of my original units from Coit. Coit had uh, hired a, stole a guy from Prokin. I don't know if you know him, Keith Swensky. And he was a... I'm not exactly sure what his position at ProChem was, but they hired him to make proprietary units for them. And they it was the most basic of PTO units you could imagine. They used that same belt design you were talking about. And you had a big uh, iron rod that you would crank up, you know, once you put the thing in the neutral. There was a throttle on it, though. You weren't running at full speed. And utilized one of these uh, wall heaters like you got there and then, and then there was just a 45 blower and a cap pump bolted right to the floor of the van and a DEMA valve for metering and that was it. No covers, no belt guards, no protection, nothing and a waste tank 
And I was uh, telling Fred yeah. earlier that the, the way to drain the waste tank is right out the bottom of the van, right in the middle. There's no way to hook up a, a hose or anything. So you just drove onto the customer's lawn when you were done. <laughs> you had to dump midday. But they thought everybody was going to be able to get back to the coit plant at the end of the day and drive over this pit that they put in the parking lot, and you would dump that and way. Dump there. Yeah. Up there, yeah, but uh, it was pretty often that quite guys would get uh, pulled over on the freeway for dumping between stops. <laughs> <laughs> don't stop. I Keep don't, going. I don't doubt that. In fact, I'll show you a steamway machine. The original Turbomatic didn't have a waste tank. Um, <clears throat> but you're exactly right, and that's they they there was a lot of back then. There was a lot of things that uh, we could get away with that I don't think we can get away with now. Um, I think what we can, Mike Palmer is probably the first one at Hydromaster to bring truck mounts into the marketplace and sell them to a lot of people. Um, he sold his first machines in 69, and he regards the beginning of Hydromaster to be late 71, early 1972. Um, Mike's out on a golf course now, so um, it's hard to get him to come in, but occasionally he drops by our place and I get to talk to him and we get to tell some old war stories. But um, the the, uh, the the Baron was the first machine, and then the Baron, this is the Baron II. This is probably the first full production truck mount that Hydromaster made. You can see it getting to be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more bells and whistles on it. This was the original Hydromaster plant after they moved out of his garage. Um from things. This is the original Bobcat. A lot of you might remember the Bobcat 2, which was a smaller version of this, but the Bobcat actually came out before the Hydrocat. So this replaced the Baron and was his original, and I'm pretty sure that's an own an engine on the front of that. It sure looks like one. Um, so that's, uh, if you take a look at the Bobcat, and then the Hydrocat. The Hydrocat went the Hydrocat 1, the Hydrocat 2, the Hydrocat 3, the Hydrocat 4. So there, the, a lot of guys started with a Hydrocat. I, there's still some that operate out there. Um, but this was probably when Hydromaster really began to hit its stride um, with the Hydrocat and, and the various models of Hydrocat. And my recollection, you know, when I came to work at Steamway, this was the Hydromaster machine that we were competing against at Steamway. It was the Hydrocat was the cat's meow from Hydromaster, and then the Prochem 400 from uh, and the 150 from Prochem. So this is uh, another one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is the that machine you see in the background is the Steamway Turbomatic. It came out in 1973, 1974, and there's a guy. I don't think he's on the line with us tonight, <clears throat> but there's a guy I got to give credit to. The guys who really invented this, my dad was certainly not an engineer. Um, he was he was a salesman. The guys who really invented the Steamway tur Turbomatic were, were a guy named Larry Hawkins. He was an engineer for Steamway up until he retired. And, and a guy in California who still operates a carpet cleaning company called His name was Ralph Greco. Some of you have probably Ralph at a Howard Partridge events uh, developed the Steamway Turbomatic. This was from Ohio Steamway Distributors. For those of you, uh, I know Jim Pemberton and is was good friends with John Masseri. For those of you from the Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, remember fondly the Steamway Distributor out there named John Masseri. John was the first one to introduce the Steamway truck mount. It was called a Turbomatic. This was the very first event that it appeared at. And but the main thing I see from that picture is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they, they look, that's how they dressed when they used to go to carpet cleaning. Because um, John Masseri, Dick Hook at, at Great Lakes Steam in New England, uh, Howard and Carol Ritchie in Amarillo. They were seminars. They were the early Steamway distributors, and I'm sure I missed one of them. Even Bob in the last seminar programs had a guy named Jeff Bishop, a guy named Ron Tony, a guy uh, on it together. Uh, so they, they were having seminars 
um, you know, Ed was de Ed York was out in California developing the uh, starting to develop the concept of the IICUC at the time. But this was the first seminar, and that's why they're looking at it so funny. These guys had never seen a truck mount before, so you know they were trying to figure out what it is. And for those of you who uh, who who weren't around at the time, it literally um, and and you'll you'll occasionally see this argument. It was literally the late '90s before the number one argument that a truck mount salesman had at a trade show was not is my Steamway truck mount better than Pro Kim's or better than than Larry Cobb's or better than than Hydromasters? It was why would I want to spend ten fifteen grand on a truck mount? Uh, I have a picture I meant to put it in I forgot. The uh, the Powermatic, the Steamway Powermatic, when it was introduced, um, was seven thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars, and you would think that that was a that was an arm and a leg back then. That kind of truck mount now, in fact, it's still a version of it still made by uh, the guy who owns Steamway now that's in Jackson, Wyoming, named Dave Nally. It's twenty something, twenty six, twenty seven, but that truck mount when it was brought out was seven thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. Yeah, Eric talked about he bought his first Powermatic from Dick Hook. Eric, I saw Dick Hook two weeks ago. He's doing well. He's 89 years old. So um, for those of you from Michigan, uh, Eric, Dick is alive and well. Um, but that's this was the Steamway Turbomatic. Um, is that your machine on the top, Lauren? It might be, it might be George Gibson's machine um, because that's George yeah. Gibson in the lower right-hand corner. Is that uh, carpeted with like red and blue shag carpet? Yeah, it's carpet blue and brown. Inside. Yep. Blue and brown. Yep. Wow. Yep. That was the Steamway Turbomatic. Now, Mike mentioned the Steamway Turbomatic. If you see it, they used a waste tank that they were a spun waste tank that they were using on their portables. It didn't. That was the waste tank. It had a pump out. Um, unfortunately, the pump out only pumped into the street, but it did have a pump out on it. <laughs> so that, there was no waste tank on the original Turbomatic, and um, in fact, I don't think the Turbomatic ever had a had, had a waste tank with it, and it was sold at least till the late '80s. Um, Those are the exchange caps up top. No, that would that be a fuel oil burner. That was a fuel oil burner. All the all the original huh. Steamway machines. Yeah, the first Steamway machine with a heat exchanger wasn't until the mid '90s. Okay. Uh, I thought you guys would love this picture, mainly for the van. Um, this is at a trade show. That's my father on the right. That's Mac Hubbard on the left. Um, that was a demo van. Yeah. Um, looks just like uh, Rick Aranda's now, His doesn't it? Don't you guys think that looks just like <laughs> Rick Aranda's black uh, sapphire one? Um, I, I see the gonna, stereo. <laughs> I was going to send him a picture of this and go, this was a demo van, Rick. Um so the, the uh, but that's uh, that was a trade show they were at probably in New England probably would be my guess it was the NEIRC the New England Institute of Rug Cleaning trade show back then and that is a Turbomatic in the background so this picture doesn't have a date on it but my guess is about seventy four seventy five. Is that Did a going retro by the back wheel? <laughs> What's that? Is that a lint that filter is, by the back wheel? That is an inline lint filter. Yeah, the, that was one that uh, Steamway made. Uh, Hydro, uh, Hydromaster made one under the Clean Master brand, and Steamway made one. They were clear view filters, and you set the whole idea was you set them out so the customer could see the dirty water going by, but it also filtered all the lint out on the way. And um, so interesting how it's coming from the top. Why wouldn't it yep. overfill? It, uh, I don't, uh, didn't overfill. Later, that was, they became the first pump outs. Uh, we dropped pump outs into them. Dennis Bruders made a pump out for a long time, not out, out of a clear view filter, but that pumped out by the water going in. You want to get 10 carpet cleaners in a, in a good argument. Just get 10 guys who are or think they're engineers and have them argue about um, automatic pump out technology. Because I don't no, think I've ever met three. I don't think I've ever met three of them in the room. And all agree on the right way to build a pump out. But uh. anyway, so <laughs> that that's from that. This is the prototype Steamway Powermatic. It came out in 1978. There was pro probably 
3,000 of this unit sold. It changed color over the year. It changed engines. But um, for those of you who never got a chance to see this machine, it also had a generator on board. It needed uh, voltage to go to the burner, so it had a, a generator. So Steamway guys were plugging their RX-20s and air movers into their truck mount. My favorite story of, um, of uh, the generator was about 1984. Jeff Bishop was teaching a class for Mac Hubbard in New England in a hotel. Um, and the power went out in the hotel. And for those of you who hate PowerPoints, back then you got to watch slides. So they had no power to the slide projector. So Mac went out and hooked up an extension cord to the generator on his demo unit. And they continued to school. Barry Costa was probably at that school, but he was a lot younger and taller then. So, <laughs> and taller. Uh, can you go back I to thought, that unit there, Doyle? Yeah, I go sure back can. To the and maybe yeah. Lauren can comment. Is that two vacuum ports, and the lower one has a big ball valve on it? And they're going into the bottom of the truck, so I assume that now they're the making bottom, a... Uh, the bottom one is, a, is the dump valve coming from the waste tank. If you look to the right, you can see that. The top one is the vacuum port. And then the one to the left is the blower exhaust, probably. Because the one, the in, no, that's the engine and blower engine exhaust. exhaust. The one to the right is the heater exhaust. The far yeah. one to the left is the burner exhaust, yeah. Uh, that's how we used to, there were two ways we used to brand our loyal Steamway customers. <laughs> one, they had no, they, one, they had no leg hair from that burner exhaust. <laughs> And two, see, it's a good thing I don't work for them or that now they'd be suing me, huh? Um, Dave Daly, please don't sue me. Um, and then the, uh, the, the other way was you could not get to part of the parts inside of the Steamway machine without touching the exhaust above the engine. So that we, we called that, you, you got a burn there. And so we kind of, we kind of branded Steamway. Uh, Dora, what was the thought on the pressure regulating system on those machines? It was the most convoluted nightmare. And what was the matter with just the regular cap pump, you know, knob on the front of the machine that you turn to go up and you turn to go down? Didn't involve two crescent <laughs> wrenches every time you wanted to. Yeah, it. Lauren can probably tell you that better than I can. I wasn't involved in the engineering of them. I know that that the Turbomatic used a pulsation dampener, which is a con was a you know that was the 1990s version of the argument for the Kunkel valve. Mm -hmm. I I can't answer that specifically, but I'll bet somebody can who's listening can chime in. Um, I know that it it oper it operated well that way for you know the 25 years that I was there, 23 years that I was there. Didn't have a you know that was not. That was not one of the issues that Powermatic had was was regulation issues or pressure regulator issues. Yeah, was it true uh, that the guy that designed the Powermatic uh, was a designed Russian submarines? <laughs> so, I forgot you told me that. You told it to me with a straight face. I always believed it. You know what? That's a good enough story <laughs> that I'm going to continue it. I have no idea if it's true. Well, you heard it here but first. I'm going to continue it. Um, no, I don't think so, but I like that story. Um, you know this industry, if you tell a story uh, uh, Twice. long enough, it, it becomes the facts. So, um, but I, what I especially wanted to point out on this machine are the Dymo t printed labels below the gauges. Um, we have better ways to do prototypes than that now. But back then, when you made a prototype, you used one of those Dymo. Some of you remember that they label makers that you had to squeeze yeah, a trigger to put the letter into. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's a, how that's this machine guy came out production. No, no, no. This was a this oh, was a prototype. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they had to make sure it the, a, a novel concept that uh, that will get a kick out of most truck mount owners who feel like they're the guinea pigs. The oh, idea is to see. The idea is to, is to put the thing out and use it for a few months to see if it works before you start selling it to people. Um, to can, we get, uh, can you sue people retroactively? Because I thought Larry Cobb patented that uh, dyno technology <laughs> on pulling truck mount dials. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> now, we didn't bring it out like this, but it probably did use decals. It, the, screen printing, the screen printing came along later that made it pretty. Here comes, so. here comes Larry. 
<laughs> Larry Cobb is tight. Here we go. <laughs> He's going to get you for that, Mike. Him and Nick Nellis are coming after me. He's going to get you for that. <laughs> okay, here's a, there's a, the pulsation dampener was to compensate for the pump cavitation due to the chem feed system. But out of respect to Mikey, I won't blab till the red light goes out. That's what Wayne said. So thanks, Wayne. Um, oh, Lauren was talking about the three-way valve. Yeah, the, it, that, that's what it was. That's what you're asking, Mikey. It had a three-way valve so you could turn from a high, medium, and low pressure quickly without yeah. adjusting a regulator. That's what it was. So you just turn it to high, high medium, and low. That's, I should have known that. All right. Yeah, Larry says they use stick-on labels. Not Dymo, so there, Mike. Okay. Stuck on. All right, let's talk about ProChem. Those of you who don't know that these are terrible pictures of a ProChem, so please somebody send me a picture of a ProChem 400. Um, wow. It's, um, I don't think Mike wants to send – maybe Mike Roden can send me one, but I don't know if he would want to since he's with the other guys now. But um, if you talk to Mike Roden, for those of you who don't know, ProChem was a chemical company before it was an equipment company. And the first ProChem truck mounts didn't come out till I think, 76. I can look in my notes and make sure of that. Um, Mike Roden was Jim's brother, but Mike was a chemical salesman. I mean, Jim was a chemical salesman. Mike was the engineer and the truck mount guy, and he was the guy that invented the first um, ProChem truck mount, which was the 400. It used, for those old timers, they love to talk about the Malsberry heaters. Lee can probably talk more about the Malsberry heater than I can. But I remember when I first got into the industry, when I first went to work for Steamway in, the, in 83, it was always about the Mallsbury heater on the ProChem 400. But, um, you know, ProChem rose fast. Uh, the, the, uh, the, they, were, they, they, came, they got to the party late after Hydromaster, after Bain Clean, after Steam Action, uh, you know, after a lot of the companies. But by the late 70s, they were a force in truck mounts. Uh, I started working for Steamway in 1983, and, and you know, um, immediately the companies that we honed in on as competitors at the time were were Big Red and uh, Steam Genie and ProChem and Hydromaster. Those were the companies that, you know, were generally sold on a national basis. I'm sure there were others at the time, so I don't mean to demean anybody. Um, but I just have to throw this out there in case we got an old Texas guy. Anybody got an Endura truck mount? I remember those. They were out of Houston. Houston's been the birthplace of a lot of interesting truck mounts. I'm not sure why that <laughs> is. but um, um, What's going on behind the, the big uh, trash can lid? Big round part. What is that? I don't know. At the end of a tank? My guess is, yeah, probably a tank. Wayne says yeah, a burner. Probably, yeah, probably a burner. There's got to be some well, broken guys this, there. Do you know? You, well, do you know who? Uh, it might be Wayne think? Williams. I don't know. Wayne's been around a huh. long time. Okay. They're saying a Carol Burner. Yeah. If, Larry's if I recall, reaction. I think it, it was a, a Carol Burner. Yeah. It, it was. That's the the they use kerosene. ProChem did. So mm -hmm. I know that. Hmm. Yeah. Martin says it's the Carol Burner. Larry says it's the burner. So we have a consensus. It's the Carol Burner. Yeah. And Drew said his dad had one. It's a burner. <laughs> uh, I, they're still 100 A's out there cleaning carpets. I see them. There's one up here in my neighborhood. So it went by me the other day, and I wanted to pull them over and say, have you heard of depreciation? But I didn't. <laughs> um, the... Uh, Listen, I've got a, I've got some good friends. There, there's a guy, there's a friend of mine that operates, still operates. I think two. He might have one down the, one Steamoid Turbomatic, and you can eat a. It's from 1978. <clears throat> I know one of his Turbomatics that he retired had 36,000 hours on it. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. I, there, you know, anything. I bow down to anything past 10. That's my rule. Yeah. Um, I don't care who made it. If it's got more than 10,000 hours on it, um, stop. So stop we got it. one of those with 11,000 hours and 250,000 original miles on the motor, too, a direct drive, still going. Go. <laughs> but we're not yeah. running it anymore. <laughs> we sold it. <laughs> you probably sold it to some poor guy. But it's who kind of in the family. Our... Main machine? Okay, yeah. all right. 
Yeah, I, I, I had a guy bragging Shows about how... Shows up in my he, driveway when it needs repair. There you go. That's that's the key. If you're going to sell a machine that old, you're the one who's got to be able to fix it for them. Um, this was the Hydrogeny yep. 1 and the Hydrogeny 2. Um, I don't. I I found this picture. I don't know how old this is. I'd love if uh, uh, Sean Forsyth might have a picture of an old Hydrogeny. I, I asked him once, but... Um, if he's out there and can dig up an old picture of a Hydro Genie, he, he might be able to come up with some of the original Steam Genies. Because Steam Genie doesn't get a lot of credit, but they were definitely one of the first that were widespread in the marketplace, um, along with some of the other companies that I named. So <laughs> they got to get credit. Uh, this was the original Hydrovan, which is the, the, Mark, the Hydrovan and then the Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, and Mark IV. These were the different uh, revolutions of the power takeoff unit and then the direct drive units that Hydromaster made. There are people who know far more about the history of these units than I do. But um, as you can see as we go through some of these pictures, uh, direct drives, we didn't invent direct drives. Like I said, Ball Weber and Judge made them in the late 60s. There's been all kinds of different ways that direct drives have been made. Um, some engineers that that, um, um, that can tell you some of the different things. In fact, I have a list of the ways that some of our engineers said that, that you could make a power takeoff unit. But these are some of the original early CDSs. Uh, the, 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 so they were around early on. So that... The, I was going to close with some information about the future, but I thought this would probably be a good time to stop and see if anybody has any questions about um, that I can answer or that any of our other listeners can answer hmm. about some of the early machines. Anybody Lee, typing anything? You? Lee knows everything. Uh, Lauren's, Lauren's typing. Oh. So is Larry Calm. Larry's raising his hand. Larry, if you have a microphone, yeah. we could turn you on if you got one. Uh, oh, yeah, Kimco. Yep. Yep. He does. He does. Yep. Okay, let me. We ran the old Chemlon units. My dad went and got them out of the scrapyard in Minneapolis, Minnesota yep. when they went out of business, and my dad was getting, like, new parts. New things, yep. so he yeah, I was making the, them, and he was mounting his own direct drives at the time too from those. And yeah, I I meant to bring some of the early truck mount names that uh, yeah, Chemco I remember Steambrush. That's a new one to me, Lee. See you, um, TurboTech. Some of you may remember TurboTech. That yeah. was the guy who worked for Hydromaster that started his own truck mount company. Um, they looked a lot like Hydromasters. Throw some old, other old high, truck mount names out there. Treat your feet. Yep. That's a good one, Wayne. Treat your feet. Yep. Made, that's the name of a truck yep. mount. Yep. Of the cleaning company. Wow. Wow. Um, what's your theory on why there's what is there four or five small truck mount manufacturers out of Texas? How'd that happen? Did they all work for somebody and went on their own, or? I have to be careful how I say this. <laughs> you don't need to talk about that. <laughs> I'm just wondering why they're in Texas or how would that Well, happen? we talk about it all the time. And until people forget that until John Don kind of went nationwide, there were places that didn't have, i got to be careful how I say this, any decent, reputable distributors. Um, I don't know. Larry's Larry Larry Cobb's been in Texas all along. Maybe, maybe he can give some answers to that I part of it now I can say this because I was born in Texas so I'm a Texan but Texans don't they like to do their own thing and I think that might have a lot to do with it is you know back in the early days when these truck mounts were out there there were a lot of guys trying to build their own truck mounts just like there are today and you know they were obviously less complex then they didn't have to have all the safety features there were all kinds of engines on the marketplace. You know, what's killing off air-cooled engines is carb emission standards. It, it, we're only five years away from maybe only having one line of engines available. 
because it's just too expensive for some of the manufacturers that don't have market share in things like generators and stuff like that where they use a lot of them to get them carb certified. Um, but back then, you know, you went and you bought a pump and you bought an engine and you bought you, you bought a little giant heater or a, or a fuel oil burner off, you know, and you you made a truck mount. And, you know, these days you got to have a few more things on it to sell it, but some of them in the marketplace don't. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I tell you that there has – Houston has had a lot of, of the – the smaller truck mount manufacturers um, over the years. Uh, real quick, Larry Cobb, look up in the top right toolbar. You'll see a little microphone with sound bars popping out of it. To the right of it is a drop down. If you do have a mic and it's turned on, you should be able to enable it. Yeah, somebody it mentioned on about my left. somebody <laughs> mentioned about Steam Genie having two blowers. They did. They did have a machine with dual blowers on it. I forgot about that. I remember that machine. So when somebody brings out <laughs> when somebody brings out in a machine in three years with dual blowers and says they invented it, we'll have to remind them. Uh, why was magic? that a direct drive also, Doyle? The Steam Genie with dual? I don't think they're direct drive. They had a direct drive, but I don't think it had dual blowers. It might have. It might have. Oh, the other thing I I forgot to mention the Steamway Turbomatic. Our first the, the first Steamway Turbomatic had a number five blower. It had a <laughs> It was a 56 blower on it. And, oh, by the way, the other thing I forgot to mention, for those of you Ford of the Door fans, Steamway truck mounts came standard with two-and-a-half-inch vac hose in the 70s. So that's not a new wow. invention either. Yeah, they were standard with two-and-a-half-inch vac hose. Uh, some Where were you getting the hose at that time? I couldn't. I don't remember. I don't know. Was it really stiff at that time? Yeah. It was, I mean, it was you know, now it's gotten and, better. But Lauren, yeah. Lauren can tie, chime in, too. It was black and yellow and weighed a ton. I can tell you that. Oh. So it's not like the Butler's Tiger Flex Hose or whatever they call it, or, you know, and that's what I'm familiar with the name. Is it similar yeah, very, to that? Or very was it? answered it. Black and yellow, yeah. Stiff, to, yes. <laughs> Lauren added stiff, so yeah, it was very stiff. It wasn't easy to use. It, it was better to use after it got a little older, but it was durable. It was durable <laughs> stuff. But yeah, so two and a half inch hose isn't a new idea either. That's probably so, why Lauren moved from Minnesota out to California, dealing with that kind of hose. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that, dragging out through the two feet of Minnesota snow. You think, Lauren? Oh, you want to know what? Bombing old snowman looks like today after I was dragging it through. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I had a snowman in my van today. <laughs> yeah, Don, Don, Don says farm supply had them. They probably did. I, they, they obviously weren't yeah. made for the carpet cleaning industry. We weren't big enough at the time to even register on the radar. Yeah, I remember that hose. Uh, when I started working with Coit, they had just bought up O'Connor, which was a Bay Area big company, and all those vans had that. That heavy duty black and yellow hose, and yeah, you could run over it. it Toilet like, pumping oh. hose. That's that? probably what it was with sewage pumping. I bet that's what yeah. it came from. Yep. Yeah, these they had uh, these <laughs> wands to go with it too. I think they were like two and a half inch wands made out of like. Uh, oh yeah. Sauce. And the, the, that remember really that the, the you know the blower, the positive displacement blowers were obviously weren't invented for our industry. They were doing things like pumping peanut butter long before they pumped dirty carpet cleaning water. All right. Well, any the, I I guess we'll talk a little bit now about the future of truck mounts. Um, you know, there's a lot of things being thrown around the industry. You know, who am I to talk about the future of truck mounts? I can only talk about it from, from the vantage point of having been around them a long time and now being involved with Hydromaster. Um, but there's a lot of things that are affecting us. I already mentioned a lot of people talk about the direct drives changing, but the, the, the slide ins are going to change too. With the carbon emission standards, there's no doubt that the engine choices are going to change. And, you know, the, those that had the old 23 horsepower Kohler engines that sat out and that just sat out and lasted the cast iron, they just went on and on and on. They, you can't make those anymore. They won't, they won't pass the standards. So you all have heard a lot of these things about the vans and the unibody construction and different things like that. 
and that's been talked about in Mikey's board ad nauseum, so I won't spend much time about it on here other than to say that the vans aren't a problem. So if whatever van, I, I just tell people before, before you buy your van, if, if you're stuck on a certain brand or model of truck mount, talk to the people who are going to sell you that truck mount because it's um, there's no doubt that it is uh, – I gotta turn this off for a second, so excuse me while I otherwise I'm gonna um get ahead of myself. The the vans aren't a problem. I mean there are some things to talk about, but obviously the, the, the unibody, the high roof vans, I think are the future of the industry. And I think the thing that, that has everybody talking about it is how is that gonna affect direct drive units? Um, all of the direct drive units are going to be affected. You can't put the way that they're constructed. Now, I mean, I don't want to speak for Butler and Cleanco and Sapphire, but but I have talked to, you know, we, the, the, none of them are going to be able to take the drive shaft through the firewall and through the, the, the way in these vans that they've been made before. So something's going to give if you want those because you can't do it. So... Um, there's going to be changes in truck mounts, and I think you're going to see changes in slide ends. I think you're going to see um, different developments that people are going to claim as new. I mean, one story I wanted to tell if we had time was uh, if, if any of your Aussie cleaners are listening to this later on, they'll get a kick out of this because my brother and I went over to Australia in the early 90s and to show steamway truck mounts. At the time, I believe the only American truck mount that was even available in Australia was ProChem. I could be wrong. At the time, there were several Australian truck mount manufacturers. I think there's still one, but there were several over there then. And one of the, the these guys were innovative. I mean, when we went over there, they were already using an air-water separator, which is an idea that's been bounced around for years about truck mounts to increase vacuum performance, is that once you suck it up, you separate the water from the air, and they had a gizmo that did that. Um, they, they, they invented a, they had a, when we got to Australia, they had a dual wand flapper valve, which with a flapper valve, it was a Y connect like we all had here, but it had a flapper valve in it, and when it worked right, which it didn't work as well as it should have in the demo that I saw it, but the the way that they would, if you if your guy sat down a wand and he was dual wanding, it would close off his vacuum. So maybe one of our brilliant inventors can take that idea and run with it. So, I mean, these were ideas back in the 90s, but the fun thing about going to Australia is we weren't really wanted there. We were obviously, there was a distributor at the time, Advanced Specialized Equipment, who's still a very strong distributor in Australia, and and uh, John Hickey owns the company. He was, uh, Rick Aranda's good friends with John, like I am. Um, the uh, John was, was selling a lot of dry ease equipment, and he wanted to, to start, he was thinking about selling truck mounts, so he invited us over. So Greg and I got off the plane in Australia to go to a trade show, and we were met at the bottom of the, the, it wasn't a jetway, it was the old, it was the stairs. We came down the stairs of the airplane, and there was a, a representative from an Australian truck mount manufacturer, whose name will remain uh, to protect the guilty. And he was a pretty big dude, but luckily so is my brother. Because we got to the bottom of the ramp, and he said, are you the guys from Steamway in America? And we said, yes. And he said, turn around, get back on the plane, and go home. We don't want you or need you here. <laughs> so that was, our wel that was our welcome to Australia. Um, luckily, the cleaners in Australia liked the truck mounts, and, and John became a, a, a big dealer for Steamway right away. Uh, we were selling tons of truck mounts into Australia from day one. So once they really saw what truck mounts could do and they were more widely available, they, and a lot of times I get asked why truck mount. There are tr lots of truck mounts in the UK, but not near as many in Australia. And I think the answer is is the UK has no place to park and thin streets. <laughs> Where in Australia you've got residential homes much like ours. 
So the, the, the truck mount is around UK and it's growing, but it took off instantly in, in Australia. So just some fun information for any of our foreign guys that are listening. Um, and obviously, you know, CleanCo has been dominant in Canada for years. For those of you who don't know who CleanCo is, CleanCo builds a direct drive truck mount, in, and they, they've been big in Canada forever. So they deserve a lot of credit for that, too. All right, so what does the future hold? Well, I told everybody that I'd say something new tonight that I haven't said to the Mikey's Board crowd before trying to get some people interested in what they might get to see. But I mentioned to you, so what's the future of direct drive truck mounts going to look like? Mike and I talked about this last year. Well, it was 9 to 14, wasn't it, Mike? About And, you know, tail shaft power takeoffs, transmission power takeoffs, water and oil hydraulics, pneumatic power, direct driving the blower from the engine. Within the engine department, alternative fuels, all of those things have been tried. Some of them have been tried, visited. They may be revisited or evaluated. But trust me, uh, there's going to be power takeoff units in the field. And, and one of the ways I can tell you that is because there one of them is. Uh, that's a Ford Transit. That's a beta unit being delivered to a person I can't tell you whose name is. That's a direct drive unit in a Ford Transit. So, because I knew that would not be enough for Mikey P. I had to show that real quick. So, go back there you go. Uh, sorry, we can't go back to that picture. But anyway, that was it on a job cleaning. So um, it is like out in the field. They're, yeah. they're out in the field being tested. Yeah, the, the, uh, they're out in the field being tested now. So, you know, and and the the, the uh, I, I know a lot of guys, and I understand this, that people often ask me, for, the, for those of you who've been around a long time and have lived through some early stages of a new truck mount and you feel like the guinea pig for the truck mount manufacturer, people always ask, why don't, you know, why don't those people at ProChem or Sapphire or Hydromaster, why don't they test their machines better before they bring them out? Why don't they do like um, Chevrolet does? Well, you got to remember, <laughs> Chevrolet is going to sell about a quarter of a million cars when they bring a new car out. I I think even on Rick Aranda's best day, he's not going to make it to a quarter of a million truck mounts. Uh, I think he and Polis combined might be able to get there, but no, it's uh, the, 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 there is a reasonable period of testing, but you guys live it every day. You can't reinvent cleaning with a truck mount like Mark does where he lives when it's 20 below zero in a test lab. You can't reinvent it in a six-month field test. You can't put a truck mount three years into Death Valley or Palm Springs in California and see how it's going to hold up to the heat. That Odyssey truck mount that I showed you before, we had to get the, uh, we had to prove to Kohler, because it had a Kohler engine in it, that we could keep the temperature inside of that chimney below 135 degrees all the time. And so our design did that. The problem we ran into in Kohler's initial test to see whether they would warrant the engine in that use was that the ambient temperature inside the van was 150 degrees, which was over their threshold. So we kind of told them, well, the problem with you denying the warranty on that is that there's about a whole bunch of Kohler engines on truck mounts already out there that are sucking in 150 to 160 degree air on a hot day off the asphalt in Phoenix. So, oh, really? So anyway, I mean, that, that's for those of you who live in a really hot climate or a really cold climate or a really salty climate, um, truck mounts, until they're out in the field, they, there's some things you just don't discover until they've been out there. And that's that's the yeah. way it's always been and probably the way it always will be because of the size of the industry. You can't spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on on engineering and testing these things before they get to the marketplace. So that's all I had, Mike. Anything, anything else? 
Ah, you did a great presentation. I, think I, I could have sat there at every one of those picks and and uh, asked you far more questions, but it's almost two well, hours. Thank anyway. you. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully we've generated as many questions and, and people raising their hand that want to jump in and talk as we did anything, because I don't know everything about any of this. I just know enough about it that I've cared to gather some of the history. Um, I'd love to get more accurate information. If, if somebody knows something I said is wrong, point that out. I did that in the blog, and I got lots of good feedback. Um, doesn't, you're not going to hurt my feelings because a lot of this old history is gone. It's, it's not around in written form. So, um, and it's also a great opportunity, Mike, I, to make up a good story like the Steamway Powermatic was designed by a submarine <laughs> engineer. I, I think that's a great one because so we could just start, you know, if, if nobody's around that, rem that was, you know, involved at White Magic, we could start making up stories about their truck mounts and, and and blue blue well Tom Fielding's still around so we can't make up good stories about blue line truck mounts. No, right? but we can make up all kinds of fun vortex stories. Holy mama! There you, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, how, did, how did that not even come up in this whole conversation? Because this vortex. is just the beginning. Literally, we didn't go that. I knew that. That well, here's another. I'm glad you mentioned that, especially for those people who are watching this later on and and at they're at the end. How can we even talk about this? I didn't. I really stopped. In those pictures, there's a few things past that, but I stopped with those pictures in about 1982, 1982 or 1983. Now, some of those later Hydromaster machines came after that, but yeah, this I wasn't even attempting to address all the things that came out in the 80s and 90s on truck mounts, just the beginning of them. Um, obviously, we got into some discussions about them, but it would be fun to continue this maybe and talk about, you know, zero in, if, if enough people are interested in it, zero in on a specific time period. Because um, I, you know, I, the, uh, I, I still talk to the, the guy, Larry Hawkins and, and Henry Kell are, were the engineers at Steamway. God bless, they're still with us. Um, they're, they're both alive and retired and happily living in Colorado. Uh, obviously, some of the old pro chem guys around, they can tell us, you know, specifics about why they did things certain ways. Um, and thank goodness, Lauren Eglund is still alive. So uh, he he helped us with a lot of this information. So well, I credit you know, myself for keeping Lauren alive by selling him a, a rotovac <laughs> and his his last uh, uh, his last steep he bought off of me too. There you go. Oh, only sixty-six. Jeez, big deal. There there. Go. He's got, a, he's got another it's, fourteen years at him. It's a fun time. I think you're going to see some some exciting things in the industry coming out. Obviously, mm -hmm. with the with the with the unibody vans, I think that's going to create some good new inventions. Tools, you know. God bless Eric. The zipper is the hottest thing in the industry, and and. I, I don't want to give Sager too much credit for that. So, um, but uh, hey, I the, just am a happy user. There you go. I yeah, really am. Yeah. Well, hey, yeah, I'm a happy user. I just got a notice from UPS saying that my new zipper is on the way. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I got to tell gotta, you, the Unibody van is super nice, man. That's just, uh, I'm, I don't know who's had a chance to drive one of these Transits or Promasters, but... Uh, what a different experience from driving a, you know, a GMC or a Ford. Really nice. Really handles well. Yeah, I like they, my new off-road tires. <laughs> I I can tell you this: the the for those of you who've never been inside of these of these vans, like the Transit or the Promaster, or the Nissan, it's it's almost funny to watch a carpet cleaner get in them for the first time and walk around and and go. I can stand up. I can stand up. It's like they've discovered a new toy. So uh, <laughs> it, it, if you think about all the years we've been leaning in vans trying to haul tools and air movers and dehumidifiers and RX-20s, everything else in and out of those vans, uh, the, the unibody vans, it, let's just hope they hold up. That's the, some of the yeah, issues okay. that they're having is from the inside out. So um, 
Mark doesn't have to worry about that because he'll insulate his van, so that'll protect yeah. it from the scrub wand falls over and hits the edge. Lee, oh, you got to be really you lucky gotta on that. Are too thin. Yeah. The, we're, that's the feed. That's the, the <laughs> one feedback that we're getting that's negative on the unibody vans is people that have tools or things spill in the back and hit the side and dent them from the inside out. So yeah. if you put up insulation, you don't have to worry about that. Lee, I think we should let Lee tell a final story. Yep. Yeah, come on, Lee. Uh, Anything no, you want. No, story with Ah, darn it. Lee, you turned your mic off. Try again. There you go. Oh. Nope. You sure? Yep, there you are. Yeah. Go. Now I'm still talking? talking? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just, what the heck? Anybody want a limp sync for him? It's cutting out on him. <laughs> yeah, you're cutting out, Lee. I'm sorry. I think Lee found that sorry. microphone under his couch from 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that came with his... I just got it. It came with his Commodore Amiga. <laughs> hey, you know, well, I was going to let Lee tell the, tell the uh, I was going to tell Lee let Lee tell the last story because I wanted him to know he's not old. Because I I like to tell the story of a we had a customer in Wyoming that was cleaning carpets full time. He was in Lander, Wyoming, at the age of ninety two. So Mark. You got a ways yeah. to go before you could, can't help the guys out anymore when you got too many <laughs> jobs. Ninety-two years old. That's a, if anybody knows of hey. an older carpet cleaner than ninety-two. That's awesome. Wow. Ninety-two. No. I had somebody giving me static 92. yesterday. I'm going to turn fifty-five this summer, and they say now I'll get a senior citizen discount. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Well, I like to p tell people when they ask, you cleaned your first carpet in 1974, how old were you? I was three. It's hard to push that wand around, but I was three, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's been a lot of, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Hopefully we didn't bore the crap out of everybody under 30, but um, it's been a lot of fun to talk about some of the old times, and, and I'm glad Larry Cobb can join us because he's, he's certainly been around and and has a, a better engineering background than I do to describe why we did some of the cockamamie things we all did over the years. Um, there have been a lot of great ideas in this industry. I tell people that all the time when inventors come up to me and they're kind of sheepish about something they've thought about uh, in doing. And I tell them, you know, so the best inventions in our industry, including the original truck mounts, were designed by carpet cleaners, not by rocket engineers from Boeing. So, yeah. you have a lot of time to sit there. Ah, shoot. Hey, Doyle. I've got work. a question. Somebody's trying to talk. Oh, no, but your microphone cuts out, Lee. It's not. Oh, working. you're okay. That's okay. Now hold that. That's Sorry about that. Right now. Hold okay. That. Just while we're cleaning, you probably have to push the button down on there and keep it down. I don't have a. Don't feel bad, Lee. I had to borrow my headset from one of my gaming sons, so he had to teach me how to use it. Uh, huh. Well, shoot. All right, Lee, well, we'll, we'll get you a, a real headset. We might have to do a night just with you. Well, I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity. And any time I get a chance to talk about my dad, I like to do that. So, uh, and, and there's a lot of guys like him that we need to, to remember and, and thank for all the stuff they did way back in, in the early days and, and, you know, some of the stories that uh, – you know, of the old days when people were being sued for being called steam cleaners and everything else that goes way back. And the, I, I just, I just, the last thing I think we'll leave everybody with is 
we do know why um, over the years that r the Restoration Industry Association did change their name several times, but the first time I went to their show, it was the AIDS convention, so they quickly changed the name of that later on. So um, for those of you who aren't old so enough to remember that, that was, it was the AIDS convention. It was the American Associ Association of Interior Decorating Specialists, but that was the very first trade show that I went to. Wow. That's pretty funny. And I don't think um, uh, I don't think Jim could join us tonight, but uh, Lee Pemberton is one of those guys that we need to be thankful we still have, and any time we can glean wisdom from him, do it. Yeah, I'd like to uh, love to get uh, Lee on here. I think Lee's probably more a little a little more computer savvy than his son is. Actually, he's on it all day long and. <laughs> <laughs> he's a pretty amazing guy. Hey, Steve Polis joined us. There, there's well, your Doyle, guy. I, I thank you so very much right. from our family too. So yeah. Yeah. Very. Uh, thanks to all the Sagers. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Mike. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. We want yeah. to do more more of it. We certainly can. We should. Certainly. And, uh, hey. and uh, everybody go out and buy something. We'll be at the event in uh, April in Atlanta. We're going to have a little truck mount fest going out in the parking lot. If you love this kind of stuff, come out and, and then we'll have Steve Polos there and Doyle. I assume you're going to be there and Mark can be there. Lee's going to be there. The whole Mikey's yep. Fest gang will be there. We're going to have a bunch of new wands to test out and see what we can make uh, old new again. Right, Doyle? You bet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Well,